Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at virginiafarmbureau.com. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all of the wonderful products we enjoy, brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. A recent trade conference highlighted the importance of exports to Virginia farmers. Mark Viette shows us how to care for succulents, the perfect house plant, and we explore why Victory Gardens were so important to America and the lessons they still teach us. Welcome back everyone. We are coming to you from a Richmond Southern State store where they're gearing up for spring and hotel meeting rooms and conferences aren't where you expect to see farmers with spring this close to bloom. But as Norm Hyde reports, with several important trade negotiations on the horizon, there's a lot of interest. The 10th Annual Virginia Governors Conference on Agricultural Trade in March brought the ambassadors from Canada and Mexico together with the governor of Virginia and plenty of farmers. Everyone at the event agreed it was important for the state to secure farm exports around the world. In 2017, Virginia exported $2.64 billion worth of agriculture and forestry products. That's about 30 percent of farm and forest cash receipts. Our crops have had uh, quite a bit of devaluation in the last few years, which has caused uh, difficulties making budgets work for agriculture. And we need that trade to improve, and we need those commodity values to go up. Governor Ralph Northam told the conference he remains committed to promoting Virginia farm and forest exports around the world, and to working at the state level to update the North American Free Trade Agreement. NAFTA was signed more than 20 years ago, and Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. are currently negotiating an update to the treaty. Since NAFTA was enacted in 1996, Virginia agriculture and forestry exports to Canada have grown by 475 percent, and to Mexico by more than 1,300 percent. These two countries alone import 17 percent of all Virginia agriculture and forestry exports. In a panel discussion at the conference, the ambassadors from Canada and Mexico agreed a new NAFTA is in the best interest of all parties. But nothing's ever easy in world politics. When the conference was held the first week of March, President Trump had just proposed steep import tariffs on steel and aluminum products, a promise he carried out a week later. Canada and Mexico were exempted from the tariffs temporarily. Anything that threatens free trade worries American farmers, said American Farm Bureau Federation President Zippy Duval. When we start putting tariffs on things, we can look back in history and see what happens. And it's exactly what Mr. Purdue said just a few minutes ago. Most of the time, agriculture gets the blunt of that. China is important to us. It is important market for our soybeans and other agricultural products like corn, dairy, pork, and uh, poultry and cotton. And let's not forget that China is a, a top market for Virginia uh, exports, nearly $3 billion of, of ag agriculture exports leave, leaving Virginia going to China. The threat of new tariffs certainly complicates NAFTA negotiations, but Duvall and other parties say they're hopeful that cooler heads will prevail and a new treaty can be reached before the end of this year. I think if we all stay calm and watch the professionals work through things that we'll get back to some uh, standards that work for agriculture and help with agricultural trade. Angle raises corn, wheat, soybeans, barley, milo, canola, and rapeseed. Many of his crops are made into flour or animal feed, but a significant portion of them are also exported. American farmers are some of the most efficient in the world, and grain prices have been declining as supplies grow. So anything that slows farm exports truly affects Angle's bottom line. We've talked a long time about how can agriculture produce enough food for the growing population of the world, that really doesn't bother me. I know that agriculture in the 
can produce the food. What bothers me is how those economies can afford to buy it. It doesn't do them any good to need it if they can't afford to buy it. And we've all got to have good trade so that all economies of the world can do well. From the positive mood at the Governor's Conference on Agricultural Trade, it appears there is still plenty of goodwill among NAFTA negotiators, and hopes are other trade disagreements can be worked out. In Richmond, Virginia, I'm Norm Hyde. Exports of all Virginia agricultural and forestry products grew 62% from 2002 to 2016, peaking at just over $3.35 billion in 2014. There was a slight decline the following year due to the higher value of the U.S. dollar and slower global growth. The largest Virginia ag exports in 2016 were poultry products, soybeans, tobacco, wheat, dairy products, and beef. Soybeans and soy meal are even more prominent in export sales in 2017. Hardwood lumber is another strong overseas seller from the Old Dominion. The top international destinations for Virginia farm products have been China, Canada, Switzerland, Mexico, and Russia. I'm Mark Viet. Coming up on In the Garden, I'm going to talk about a hot new trend. Stay with us. More than 90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made a promise to our local farmers to protect and preserve a way of life they'd worked so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member and enjoy the many benefits of membership. There's a local Farm Bureau in every county of the state. We think everyone should be a friend of the farm. Visit our website at vafb.com to learn more. Looking for a low-maintenance house plant? Mark Viette has some tips to care for your succulents in the garden. Cacti and succulents have really become popular over the last few years. And part of the reason is you can grow them indoors. You don't need to grow them outdoors, though many of us do. They're easy to grow. They do not take a lot of water. In fact, overwatering sometimes will kill some of the cacti and succulents. I'm here at Strange's Greenhouse where not only do they have large jade plants, but they have baby jade plants. Keep in mind, this plant is going to look like this, and I've seen some four or five times bigger than this. Many of the cactus and succulents do like to go through that rest period. So during some of the winter months, you might hold off on watering, maybe once a month. You might even see the leaves shrivel a little bit. Another popular succulent that we can all grow is aloe vera. It's known as the aloe plant. One of the things that these plants like is maybe afternoon sun, so at least give them full afternoon sun. I guess a couple things you just need to keep in mind is if you have cactus and they do have spines, you have to worry about your pets. I always remember I had a fluffy gray cat, long haired cat, and it got into a cactus. So you have to worry about, and that was a real pain, taking out the, um, the spines. You know, this is a euphorbia. It's in the same family as poinsettia, so plants can look very different. Now, some of the larger cactus, during times of the year when they go dormant, you have to remember a lot of plants go dormant in different parts of the world. Uh, maybe it's in the summer, maybe it's in the winter, but sometimes on some cactus, you're only going to water them maybe once a month. But really, when you look at the attractive, uh, beautiful succulents, they're great for terrariums. You can put them in little containers. You can actually take small containers like this and plant a mixture. And again, you don't want to overwater. You want to use what we call a cactus-like mix. This is a mix that drains well. And it's very important that you do not have your containers sitting in a tray. If they're sitting in a tray, the tray needs to be filled with pebbles so the water drains through. This is euphorbia, it's also known as crown of thorns. It's also related to the poinsettia. I really enjoy 
the things like the agave and you know beautiful agave, the gray agave or the green and yellow variegated agave. But I will tell you, because we grow these in our tropical garden in St. Thomas, they have very sharp thorns. So for indoor use, I recommend taking a shears and snipping the thorns so people or pets do not get hurt. Easy to grow, look at this. All different types, shapes. And the other great thing about cactus is that they grow slowly, or many of them grow slowly. So you can keep a plant for 20, 30 years. You can get your grandmother's plant or your mother's plant, and you can keep it. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Fish and Virginia potatoes go well together. Chef Maxwell has a tasty twist on a classic French recipe up next in the heart of the home. Colonial Virginians were very familiar with salt cod. Chef John Maxwell puts his own spin on this classic recipe using Virginia potatoes in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Chef John Maxwell and welcome to the heart of the home. We're here at Meadow Hall in Meadow Event Park in Doswell, Virginia, where every week we get a chance to play with some great food. Uh, almost always is big Virginia food. Today we're going to go a little international, but it's got a Virginia base. We're going to be using some Virginia agricultural products. We're going to use some dairy and some potatoes and some, some other products. But we're dealing with salt cod, an international product that uh, is kind of like the ham of the sea. It's treated like a Smithfield ham is, right, but it's fish. So we're going to be making an old French dish called brandade de Maru, which is a, basically a pate of fish and potatoes. And so I'm going to start uh, by talking to you a little bit about this. This is the salt cod that I've soaked, and I've got a piece over here soaking, so you see it's just a question of putting it in fresh water, changing the water a couple of times, and it goes from a very stiff board into something that's very soft and usable here. Right? So once I've got it soft, then I poach it in water, right? which I've got some here, right? and you can see it stiffens it up, right? cooks it, Right. And then I soak it in hot milk. Right. So the hot milk right, gives it a flavor, helps absorb some of the salt. So in order to make this dish, I need a bowl. And I'm going to put the fish in the bowl. And I'm just going to mash it down in the bottom of the bowl. Right. Just to get it broken up. And now I'm going to be working with the potatoes. All right. And I'm going to peel these so they'll mash up good. And I've got these there, and they're very hot. So I'm just going to peel these. It's easier to peel them when they're hot and cooked than when they're raw, especially these beautiful little red potatoes. Right, you get that. I want to use the waxy kind of potato for this dish because the, the brandy it's like a pate, so it needs to be silky and smooth and robust. So these will be in your market pretty soon. The skin is not going to hurt the dish, but it'll affect the te texture a little bit and it'll give you bits of color that you may not want to have. Now the secret to this is equal parts of fish and potatoes. So we need, if you're going to use a pound of potatoes, use a pound of fish. If you're going to use two pounds of fish, use two pounds of potatoes. So now I'm going to mash the potatoes up with this. I'm going to put some gloves on to finish processing this. Now I'm going to add some lemon juice and some lemon zest. Those are in there, nice and mixed up. Now you can add other things to this if you want, some chopped green onions, some chopped parsley to give it a little bit of color if you like. All right. I'm going to add the milk now. 
and there's some whole peeled garlic that I cooked with the milk that I'm going to add into it too. And now what makes it a brandade is we're going to make an emulsion with some olive oil. So now to make the emulsion, I'm going to slowly stream a little bit of olive oil in it at a time, a little bit at a time, and mix it up very good with my hands. Now, I don't like putting this in a processor because it makes it too runny, makes it too, uh, too smooth. We want a little bit of chunk to this. And it's going to take about a cup of olive oil to make this right. Now, I don't want to add any salt to this. And you can see the texture now. There's a s chunky, smooth, or loose uh, paste. And we're going to bake this. And this is going to go right down in there. Uh, the recipe calls for me to grease the pan, but in all the times I've made this, I haven't really needed to grease the pan. There's enough olive oil in it for it to be, uh, for it not to stick too much. And a little bit of sticking isn't going to be bad. We're not going to try and turn this out as a mold. We're going to use the dish that it's baked in, sprinkle it with some grated cheese. Hard cheese is best, Parmesan or Romano, something like that, and into the oven it goes. All right, here we've got the Branda de Moru, the pate of codfish, of salted cod. We're ready to serve this, and I've got some bread rounds that I have cut and toasted. Just scoop in here. And that's delicious. Absolutely delicious. If you want to find out how this tastes, I'm going to be at the French Food Festival in Richmond on April 27th and 28th, and I'm fixing this dish there. So stop on by. Say hello. So join us next week on Heart of the Home, where we get to play with great Virginia food. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at VAFB.com, as well as on Chef Maxwell's website at ChefJohnMaxwell.com. Virginia potatoes are an early summer delicacy. Grown mostly on the eastern shore for commercial purposes, the smaller red potatoes have a delicious taste and a competitive advantage. Potatoes were raised on 5,000 acres in Virginia in 2017, generating $19.4 million in farm income. Almost all those potatoes are shipped fresh to supermarkets on the east coast and as far north as Canada. Because Virginia potatoes are ready when most other potatoes are either finished or not yet ready to harvest, they have a tight market window to make their maximum profit. But you can still enjoy fresh local Virginia potatoes all summer long. There are 30,000 roadway accidents each year involving cars and farm machinery. Farmers will be moving equipment for planting in harvest season. The slow-moving vehicle triangle in red and fluorescent orange colors and flashing lights allow for quick identification. When you see an SMV sign on farm equipment, slow down, prepare for sudden stops and slow turns. Patience will save lives. Just remember we all need to share the road, we all need to be responsible, and we need to be guided by the law. Motor vehicle safety starts with you. Two thousand eighteen marks a century since the end of World War One. Dave Miller reports the lessons learned from Victory Gardens during World Wars One and Two continue to be useful today. Victory Gardens were first promoted during World War I, a century ago, as a way for ordinary citizens to contribute to the war effort. They were revived in World War II, and they continue to teach lessons today. The students at Nelson County High School not only planted a Victory Garden in the fall of 2017, they won first place at a State Fair of Virginia student horticulture competition. Victory Gardens are the perfect um, example of sustainable agriculture. Victory Garden was to produce and raise food during World War II when mass-produced uh, crops were being sent overseas probably for rations in the military and that kind of thing. Um, it was a way for people back home to produce their own food and be able to sustain themselves. It was a good experience to know how to grow a garden and 
especially later in life when you need to teach your kids and be able to carry on the tradition. So it'll keep going in the future. More than 20 million victory gardens were planted during World War II, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. These gardens produced an estimated 9 to 10 million tons of fruit and vegetables, equaling the amount of commercial production. Most communities relied on their local extension agents and volunteers to help gardeners succeed. Those lessons still resonate today. In 2017, eight high school horticulture classes entered the Victory Garden Exhibition Contest at the State Fair of Virginia. Margaret Seaman was in charge of the Nelson County students, which won the Blue Ribbon. Her students had to not only grow the vegetables, but figure out how to transport them, just like their great-grandparents did. Because we had to raise it here and then transport it to the state fair, that provided a little bit of a difficulty in how are, how are you going to do that and make it look like a real garden and not a raised bed garden. So one of the things we did, we, we grew them in big tubs and they took care of all the vegetables uh, throughout all of August and September and then we transported everything down there. We set up the background, which that was, that was something. Um, after that, we put up the fence and then we put all the plants in where they needed to be and did it all from there. Bacon, butter, and sugar were rationed back in 1940. That was followed by the rationing of meat, tea, jam, biscuits, breakfast cereals, cheese, eggs, lard, milk, and canned and dried fruit. Fresh vegetables and fruit weren't rationed at the time, but supplies were limited. So the project stressed self-reliance. The project for the Victory Garden showed students essentially, this is what growing your own food looks like. Okay, This is how you do it. This is the examples of how it's done and what it will look like in the end, what it looks like when it's growing. Um, teaching students how to grow food or teaching them where their food comes from is the ultimate goal of agricultural education, I would say, would be safe to say. And that's what our programs are here in horticulture and production agriculture. Uh, I'd say my favorite part was um, watching the plants grow from seeds up until they grew it all the way up. And building the house was pretty fun about it, too. That was a pretty good project. The student victory garden contained a lot of different vegetables and was grown in the fall, similar to home gardens during the war years. Gardening is the nation's number one hobby, and that's true even in farm country. A good amount of people around here have gardens. We are in rural Nelson County, um, and a lot of people can their food from their, their garden. So if you notice in the picture, we have a, it's the back of a house, but looking into a pantry, and it's lined with canned foods that were canned from the summer crops. And so we, we tried to even look into it as planning ahead for what was coming in the winter. If you plant it yourself, you can just go out to the garden and pick it and cook it right there in your house. The Nelson County High School students that worked on the Victory Garden Project learned how to grow sustainable food and how to succeed in a competition with students from across the state. Victory gardening is a timeless pastime being introduced to the next generation with a reminder that a regular food supply is never guaranteed. In Nelson County, Virginia, this is Dave Miller. That's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We're so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in your home, your garden, or even your chicken coop, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good week. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Farm Bureau is there when farmers can't be. The state's largest farm organization represents busy farmers at county government meetings, farm conferences, state legislative proceedings, and court cases affecting the industry. It has the farmer's back on important tax issues, environmental mandates, even ballot initiatives, and many other issues. 
A familiar institution for almost a century, Farm Bureau represents and serves producers of all commodities. And like today's agriculture, Farm Bureau is evolving to meet the needs of producer and associate members. With 88 county Farm Bureaus and more than 125,000 family members, Farm Bureau is the state's largest advocacy group. Farm Bureau's legal and political activities are directed by voting members. 17 advisory committees discuss commodity-specific issues, from apples to landscape products, peanuts to poultry. All are included in the grassroots process. Each year, County Farm Bureau members determine what needs should be addressed and what policies to pursue. After being approved each fall at the annual convention, these policies are carried out with help from producer leaders and professional staff in Richmond and Washington. For example, Farm Bureau members help pass a state constitutional amendment to protect private property rights by limiting government and utility companies' actions in eminent domain situations. Farm Bureau has helped keep farmland taxes low by supporting the vital land use taxation program. Farm Bureau was instrumental in influencing lawmakers to create the state's Secretary of Agriculture and Forestry cabinet position. Farm Bureau helped Virginia peanut and tobacco growers gain fair settlements when the national programs ended. Farm Bureau successfully lobbied for vital funding for Virginia Cooperative Extension and agriculture research programs. Farm Bureau helped bring millions of dollars in best management practices cost-share funding to rural Virginians. Farm Bureau's helped drive and guide farm policy through the U.S. Farm Bill, which is written every five years. While conventional agriculture continues to be the driving force behind policy development, Farm Bureau is evolving to represent the full spectrum of Virginia agriculture. Organic growers, the green industry, watermen, vegetable and fruit growers, horse owners and new farm businesses all are welcome at the table. Our diversity assures that Farm Bureau will continue to represent all farmers and help provide food not only for the nation and the world, but also support local food operations and alternative crops in our communities. For more than a decade, the Virginia Foundation for Agriculture, Innovation, and Rural Sustainability, known as FAIRS, has helped members find new sources of income or create business plans. The foundation was started by Farm Bureau to help producers access federal and state grant money being offered to farmers. Produce farms, dairy farms, biofuel facilities, water bottling businesses, and a clam farm are just some of the operations that Virginia FAIRS has assisted. More than $3 million in grant funds have been procured. Another way Farm Bureau helps members is by keeping public opinion on our side. The organization serves as both a voice and a watchdog for agriculture. We speak out in the news media against unfair editorials and bad government decisions. And as technology has changed how we communicate, Farm Bureau has a growing voice in both social media and the traditional press. Farm Bureau works to influence the next generation of consumers through the Virginia Agriculture in the Classroom Foundation. AITC is celebrating 25 years of improving farm literacy through appropriate curriculum and instruction to classrooms across the state. The program is reaching more than 200,000 school children each year. In addition to offering leadership training and fellowship opportunities, the Farm Bureau Women's Program is a strong financial supporter of AITC through fundraising. Many farm women are partners on the farm, but they make time to interact with lawmakers during the General Assembly. They also perform fundraising programs for many charities, including food banks and the Ronald McDonald House. And many Farm Bureau women host charity and public outreach events in their home communities. Farm Bureau provides another vital leadership and networking program to the Young Farmer Committee. Young farmers are consistent national winners in competitions through the American Farm Bureau. The program also offers a number of social and educational meetings each year at locations around the state. And the Young Farmer Program partners with other agencies to connect the next generation of farmers to those ready to retire through the Farm Link Program. To help Virginians realize the importance of the state's largest industry, Farm Bureau showcases agriculture at the State Fair of Virginia each fall. The organization saved the iconic event in 2012 following a previous bankruptcy and became sole owner of the fair and the Meadow Event Park a year later. Owning the Meadow Event Park also allows Farm Bureau to support the state's equine industry. Farm Bureau attains state and national historic designation for the property, which is the birthplace of the legendary racehorse Secretariat, who won the 1973 Triple Crown. The park hosts equine events year-round, including Secretariat's annual birthday celebration, the Virginia Horse Festival, and a number of horse competitions and shows. Thousands of Farm Bureau members take advantage of an array of money-saving programs. Discounts for dining, shopping, and travel, to name a few, are available through Member Deals Plus. The easy-to-use web and smartphone app has helped more than 30,000 members pay for an annual membership. Meanwhile, hundreds of grain producers have benefited from Farm Bureau's grain marketing program, which offers professional market advice and service. Two to three million bushels of grain are sold through the program each year. A significant portion of the grain raised in Virginia is sold overseas. 
Virginia Farm Bureau has been a partner in the Governor's Conference on Agricultural Trade since it was founded in 2008. These conferences highlight the importance of world markets in our state's farm economy and offer producers the chance to meet and hear from international buyers and ambassadors. When it comes to buying power, Farm Bureau has offered members a price advantage for farm implements, tractor and auto tires, and other equipment for more than 50 years. Members may order tires, batteries, baler twine, or even gourmet peanuts and Virginia hams from Farm Bureau's warehouse. This program serves Farm Bureau members in four states with annual sales of five to six million dollars. For nearly a century, the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation has been the voice for farmers on the local level, in the General Assembly, in Congress, in the public eye, and in the courtroom. Farm Bureau serves all farmers, young and old, conventional and organic, traditional and cutting edge. There's room for all farmers in Farm Bureau, an organization created to keep our farm economy strong and our farm future bright. Farm Bureau is there for you. Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at VAFB.com. everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all of the wonderful products we enjoy, brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. We visit a hidden flower gem in Palatine County. You could plant your own salsa garden this spring and we take a closer look at agriculture in the nation's fastest growing community, Loudoun County. Welcome back everyone. We're coming to you from Chadwick and Sun Orchids in Palatine County. And Mother's Day is quickly approaching and I know I love getting flowers for my day. But instead of giving her roses or violets, why not give her an orchid this year? This may look like a rainforest, but instead this is a hidden gem in Palatine County. Chadwick and Son Orchids Greenhouse. Inside the balmy building are literally thousands of orchids both in bloom and awaiting their colorful caps. It all started in the 40s. My father had been growing orchids since he was a child. And he grew up at a time when corsages were the orchid flower. And uh, it sort of transgressed into the pot plant industry about the 80s. And that's when we formed Chadwick and Son Orchids. So I'm the son, but he's still involved at 87. The most interesting thing about Chadwick's business is that it is truly a revolving door for customers. You see, the greenhouse is what Arthur Chadwick calls the orchid daycare. Orchids only bloom about three months out of the year. Many of his most loyal customers will bring their plants back to him to board the plants for $2 a month. The staff tends to the plants, pampering them, if you will, until it's time to bloom again. They will then contact the customer as new buds appear in about a year. It all started when we first uh, sold an orchid and someone said, well, thank you, this is lovely. Uh, when it finishes blooming now, what do I do with it? I said, well, it's really quite easy. They said, well, is there any way you could take care of it for me? I guess I could, sure. Well, now 13,000 plants later, that's what we do. Our main business is taking care of other people's orchids for $2. And they're not just sent away while they're on vacation. They, they want us to keep them until they bloom again. The greenhouse has more than 13,000 orchids. 8,000 of those are boarded plants. Chadwick and Son Orchids has the largest selection of blooming orchid plants in the area and has been a family agricultural business since 1989. Part of a farm on 18 acres of wooded land, this busy greenhouse supplies all the orchids for a small store in the fan area of Richmond. You literally have difficulty focusing while in the store because there are so many different varieties, each with a special characteristic and color. Orchids are the largest family of flowering plants with more than 25,000 documented species found on every continent. The plant's first flowers will not appear until five to seven years after germination. Many orchids sold in stores are more than a decade old. For starters, they live forever. So he has many of his original plants from the 40s, and he got them from somebody else who got them from somebody else, so they're already over 100 years old. 
And orchids will live forever if taken care of. So certainly the longevity of them. The flowers are very long lasting, several months, and come back year after year. And there's such interesting shapes and colors and styles, there's something for everyone. Orchids are popular. According to the USDA and the American Orchid Society, the orchid has surpassed poinsettias, chrysanthemums, and African violets as a favorite flowering plant for consumers. Greenhouse and nursery products are Virginia's fifth largest agricultural commodity based on cash receipts. The Chadwicks are definitely part of the state's largest industry. And they say the secret to raising a beautiful orchid in your own home is pampering the plant. General orchid care is keeping your plant damp all the time. We don't want it to get bone dry so that the leaves fall off or it falls out of its pot. And we want nice warm temperatures, 60 to 90 year round. If it gets cooler than that, sometimes it can chill them and shock them. Over, let's say 100, they get stressed out. And yet one of the secrets to growing orchids is to put them outside for the summer because there you get rainforest type conditions hot, sticky, good air circulation. That's, think of yourself as living in the rainforest. That's what the plant wants. You can find out more about orchid care and Chadwick and Son orchids at chadwickorchids.com. Virginia's green industry encompasses a wide range of operations. Virginians grow shrubs and flowers and houseplants and sod for golf courses and football fields. The combined green industry generates nearly $252 million in cash receipts for growers and operators. There are more than 21,000 Virginians employed in the green industry, doing everything from caring for the plants in greenhouses to installing shrubs in the yard and putting down fresh sod outside a new home. Each year, 15 to 20 percent of the industry is composed of spring greenhouse transplants. Even landscape architects and designers are part of the Virginia green industry. Hi, today we're going to be talking about how to grow a salsa garden from the ground up. Please stay tuned. More than 90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made a promise to our local farmers to protect and preserve a way of life they'd worked so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member and enjoy the many benefits of membership. There's a local Farm Bureau in every county of the state. We think everyone should be a friend of the farm. Visit our website at VAFB.com to learn more. Chris Mullins with Virginia Cooperative Extension has some suggestions on growing salsa ingredients in your garden from the ground up. Hi and welcome. Today we're at Randolph Farm and we're going to be talking about how to grow a salsa garden. Many of you love salsa and actually growing a garden with a lot of those components that make up salsa is fairly easy. Uh, you have tomatoes, onions, cilantro, peppers, and uh, really many of you grow those anyway, so why not just kind of work towards a salsa garden and grow those. Uh, today we're going to be talking about different ways that you can grow these, and one way is to grow a, a pot, a container garden, uh, with all these components. Um, what you see here, we have a, a container, a fairly large container, about 12 or 14 inches in diameter. It's filled with some type, with a potting soil that you'd get at a garden center. Not garden soil, but something a little different with different components. Uh, and this is something pretty easy to do. A pot this size, uh, you need tomatoes. We can grow tomatoes in here. We take a tomato transplant like this. We're going to make a depression in here. This one's a little tall and leggy, so we're going to, with tomatoes, you can bury them a little bit. We're going to get that down in there and cover it up nicely. Um, so with a salsa garden, something tall like tomatoes you'd want in a container like this, and you'd want to maybe put something like cilantro in this in the, on the perimeter. A little cilantro there, and you can grow that all around the sides. So when you take this out and put it on your deck or patio, this tomato is going to grow up nice and tall. You might end up putting some type of cage around this whole thing to keep it in. But you're going to have tomatoes, you're going to have cilantro, you could even put some onions, some onion sets in here. It's also nice when you're thinking about onion production is to get transplants, get the onion plants. And you can find those at certain garden centers, but to plant those directly in here, usually with those onion plants you get a much larger uh, onion at the end. So what you've got here is you've got a few components, onions, tomatoes, cilantro. And when you think about the tomatoes that you want to grow, you see the tomatoes behind us are really nice, big, beefsteak slicer type tomatoes, and they're very juicy. Uh, you don't want a lot of that necessarily for salsa. You don't want so much juice in your salsa. So maybe a paste or aroma 
type tomato. It might be a better variety uh, for this particular garden. So what you've got here, you've got your tomatoes again in your cilantro, um, and you could do the same thing with peppers. I don't have a pepper plant because we're not quite, quite ready for those yet this time of year, but you'd put a pepper plant right in the center, and you could also plant some more cilantro and, um, and your onions or onion plants right around here. All in all, it makes a really nice container garden, a few of these pots maybe in your, on your deck, on your patio, making sure that you get plenty plenty of sunlight during the day. All these plants are going to require at least six to eight hours of sunlight. It'd be great to have them in full sun if you could. Now one of the things you have to think about here is watering. This type of media, this potting soil, can dry out very quickly, so make sure that you check it every day. Make sure these plants aren't uh, wilting down. Make sure that you give it a good amount of water. Now one of the things you can do, because all these plants need fertilizer, is to add maybe some type of liquid fertilizer throughout the season. And you'll find directions when you go to your garden center and buy the liquid fertilizer, that water-soluble fertilizer, you'll find the directions on how much you need to add for tomatoes and for peppers. And you can just add that in with a watering can. Now another way that you could grow this is going to be out in the garden, in the garden soil. And many of you love to grow these kind of components and you can just grow them and put them together but you might think about growing them in one plot. Uh, you could make a raised bed garden that maybe is four feet wide and four feet long. And every square foot you could grow some of these components. You might have one row, maybe four feet across, where you have three tomato plants. And that will work pretty well for their spacing. And the next row up of the four feet, you might have four pepper plants. Usually those are much smaller than tomatoes. They don't get as tall. So remember to put those tall tomato plants on the north side of your bed. With those pepper plants, um, you could raise hot peppers, chilies like uh, habaneros, um, some of those hot peppers. Uh, you could also have bell peppers. It depends on how much heat you want in your salsa ultimately. And then in the front of that four by four uh, garden space, you could have your cilantro and onions planted. So kind of having all that together in one area kind of makes you work towards your salsa. Well, this can be a great thing for, for all of you to think about. Children would love this to, to work in containers and you, they can help you uh, grow your salsa garden throughout the year. Now, if you want to find more information about how to grow a lot of these plants together, uh, please contact your local county extension office and talk to a master gardener. From the ground up, I'm Chris Mullins. We'll see you next time. From the ground up is presented with the generous advice and assistance of Virginia Cooperative Extension. Visit their website at ext.vt.edu. Chef John Maxwell has a colorful and spicy salad treat in mind coming up next in the heart of the home. Root vegetables like beets are often considered a wintertime treat. Chef Maxwell shows us that you can enjoy them all year long as pickled beets in the heart of the home. Hi, and welcome to Heart of the Home. We're here at Meadow Hall, Meadow Event Park in Doswell, Virginia, and every week we get to play with some great Virginia food. Well, today we're going to be playing with some neat stuff. We're going to be, we're going to be pickling some beets. All right, so we've got good agricultural products, Virginia beets, uh, with a very spicy little brine. So I'm going to add into this, I'm going to add water, a couple of cups, vinegar, I'm using apple cider vinegar, and sugar. I'm using about half what I got, about, about a cup and a half. Now this is going to cook until it begins to dissolve the sugar. It doesn't take very long for that to happen. Right. I'm going to add some crushed red pepper and some whole coriander, some whole peppercorns. I'm making a little modified batch here. The recipe that you'll be able to find on the Farm Bureau or on my website, chefjohnmaxwell.com, um, will have the actual ingredients for this batch there. Mm -mm -mm. We want to bring it to a boil so all the elements that are in those spices can have a chance to leach out of the seeds or, or stems that they are and flavor this brine. Add a couple of bay leaves and a sprig of rosemary. 
All right. And the last spice that I need to put in here is a little bit of anise seed. Gives it that nice little licorice kind of background. And this is going to take about five or six minutes to come to a boil and get all of these flavors to blend. I've got a nice little combination of golden beets and red beets here. I get them all peeled off and down in there. I'm wearing a glove to keep my hand from getting too stained while I'm playing, especially with those red beets. All right, so nice and clean. Otherwise, it really stains badly. So I've, I've got the, the peeled beets. I'm going to add to some one inch square cuts of onion. Right. I'm going to now ladle some of this brine that's piping hot and very, very spicy. Now, spicy doesn't mean hot. Spicy means full flavored. Uh, cinnamon is a spice. Pepper is a spice too, but does, not everything that's spicy is hot. Right. Here we go. We've got these all in there. Now, I'm going to let this set for a few minutes, then I'm going to put them into cups right, and put it into the refrigerator and let it set for 24 hours. All right, now I've got the beets. They've been marinated for about 24 hours or so. I'm going to get them into this container here. I want to save some of this brine because this is going to be a boost to our salad dressing for our wonderful mixed green salad with beets. Now, if you want to cut these up, you can cut these up, but I'm, I'm just going to leave them whole right, and decorate them across the top. And you can see the difference in the color between the golden beets and the red beets. The golden beets have picked up a lot of the red color. They're still lighter. So they give you some contrast on your plate. And I'm going to sprinkle some blue cheese on top of this. You can use whatever salad dressing you want on this. It shouldn't be too big a flavor because it'll compete too much with the red beets uh, and, the, and the brine. Uh, I use the brine as, a, as the vinegar in my dressing for this and add a little olive oil to it. But whatever you're comfortable with is good. All right, and there we go, uh, pickled beets, my way. So join us next week on Heart of the Home, where we get to play with great Virginia food. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafb.com, as well as on Chef Maxwell's website at chefjohnmaxwell.com. Whether sold to grocery chains, restaurants, or directly to the consumer, few Virginia vegetables are processed. More than 1,665 Virginia farms produce more than $92 million worth of vegetables in a given year. Making lettuce, beets, potatoes, and tomatoes and other crops the eighth largest sector of the Old Dominion's farm economy. In recent years, the local foods movement has become a large driver for more vegetable production. Many beginning farmers and part-time growers raise vegetables for sale at farmer's markets through community-supported agriculture operations or at pick-your-own farms. Organically raised vegetables also offer farmers an opportunity to earn extra money for their hard work. Loudoun County has the distinction of being one of the closest rural communities to Washington, D.C. As Dave Miller reports, it also has an agricultural economy that balances the pressures of suburban growth. The beautiful rolling hills of Loudoun County were first settled in 1725 and became independent from nearby Fairfax County in 1757. For more than two centuries, agriculture was the dominant industry in Loudoun County, but beginning in the early 1960s, suburban growth changed the eastern side of the county when Dulles International Airport was built. In the last three decades, Loudoun County's population has nearly quadrupled to about 330,000 residents. Today, you'd never know parts of Loudoun County were once farmland, but agriculture is still a vital part of the community. If your intent is to, to come in new to agriculture with the idea that you'll run 120 head of cattle over 800 acres, um, 
there may be a few possibilities to do that here, but very, very few and, and fewer as time goes on. Uh, if your idea is to have a smaller parcel and to have a number of different animals, perhaps small ruminants, poultry, uh, and of course the, the horses, then it's an excellent location for that type of, of agriculture. Loudoun County was once a major dairy farm center, but the last dairy farm closed decades ago as the area transitioned to other agriculture. There are nearly 1,400 farms in the county covering about 134,000 acres. The average farm size is less than 100 acres, but Loudoun's producers have generated farm sales of more than $37 million annually in recent years. One advantage they have is the diversity of what can be raised in this fertile county and the abundance of residents and markets in which to sell. Hay and forage grass are the most prominent, followed by beef cattle and calves. Grapes, apples, and nursery products are also raised in the county, as well as poultry, horses, sheep, and goats. Locally grown foods are also an important part of Loudoun's farm economy. The demand for, for Virginia wines has led to uh, just uh, a, a large increase in the, the number of orchards and vineyards that are that are here. There are a lot of people with um, good jobs that you know that have the income um, that, and they're very interested and um, somewhat uh, enlightened to the fact that they want to buy food that is raised nearby, um, that they want to know the person who is raising their food and in hopefully more and more cases we'll see them wanting to educate their children about how food is grown and produced. A decade ago, Loudoun County had the dubious distinction of being named the fastest growing community in the country. There's no question that high income and highly educated residents are changing the character of the community. But Loudoun County farmers are working to keep remaining farms profitable. We've had more and more young people come in to farming um, lately, starting up really innovative, interesting uh, CSA programs and family farm homesteads and education programs and stuff like that. I love the sheep and they, we raise them for wool, but we really don't make much money on the wool. We make blankets, very nice blankets from up in Massachusetts that are uh, put together and we sell those. But uh, we also have a little vineyard, a couple of acres, and we sell our grapes to a, a winery and we can make a little money there. So the fact of the matter is, we need other income. And so we have two bed and breakfast cottages, and we do a wedding business. There's a demand for almost anything we can produce, um, whether it's, it's direct market meat or wool, like what's behind me, whether it's the grapes on the farm here for the wine, um, really anything that you can think of, there is a market either in Eastern Loudoun, Fairfax, Washington, D.C., and it's very close. So although our land values are incredibly expensive and our cost of doing business is very high, luckily we can also demand a pretty premium price for those premium products. Local government leaders have not been blind to the tremendous changes in their formerly agrarian community. Zoning changes in the 1990s were intended to reduce cluster growth, but as older farmers retired and the money to develop their land was so high, development kept coming. Farm Bureau leaders continue to work with their community to protect the precious farmland remaining in Loudoun County using tools like conservation easements. We need to do more first to help younger farmers get into the business. We have to um, institute a conservation easement program that the county can help support because every easement uh, may cost $40,000 at the outset to get legal fees, surveys, appraisals, and uh, the farmers need help with that. And with every new house, it costs the county more money to provide services, schools and public services. We're still farming up here in Loudoun. Um, we're going to be here. We're not going anywhere. You know, we're teaching other farmers a little bit about how to outreach to the public and show them what you're doing and, and, and have a business that really works for, uh, for that direct market to the public and being in the public eye, too. Whether it's fresh vegetables and fruit, local meats, wine, cattle, goats, horses, or sheep, you can find it right here in Loudoun County, a farming community determined to adapt and thrive in the shadow of the nation's capital. In Loudoun County, Virginia, I'm Dave Miller.
That's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We are so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good week. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. I want consumers to be confident in the food that I grow.